Is it snowing like crazy where you live? Are you preparing for a bunch of snow or maybe you already got a ton of snow? Or are you just relaxing in 80 plus degree weather right now? I don't know. I can't tell you. There's only two things I can tell you for certain. And that is it is snowing like crazy here in Chicago. And the Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Oh, what a crazy day so far. I am Jeff McAleer. I am the host here at the Daily Dope, as well as happening to be the grand poobah of the GamingGang.com. Today is Friday, February 9th, and here in the Chicago area, we are just getting loads of snow dumped on us and it uh we got a little bit of snow the other day and now last night we got a bunch of snow i was out there shoveling and we're uh out in the suburbs outside of chicago and where this house is located it's uh kind of a cul-de-sac but it's all open be our you know to the sides uh, most of the sides and behind us so all this snow blows in and I believe we've probably gotten about eight inches out here, but we are getting big drifts over here at the house. So I've been out there shoveling most of the day. That's why I'm late. And it's just, it's crazy. It's sort of like, what's the old saying? Shoveling fleas across a barnyard. None of them get there. It's start shoveling and our drive is pretty long. It's a two and a half car, car garage, I should say. And the driveway is pretty long. By the time we finish up, turn around, <laughs> It's like, okay, we got to shovel again where we started. So finally, it's like, okay, let's just let, let it keep coming because we're supposed to get more snow tonight. It's uh, supposed to be more snow tomorrow. Who knows? So anyway, hopefully you're watching this and you're not having to deal with that nonsense. Anywho, it is Friday. So that means it is Family Fun Friday here on The Daily Dope. And in just a bit, I will be reviewing Dance of the Fireflies from Backspinnel Games and Ninja Division. So stay tuned for that. I do have some news as well today. I'm also going to talk about something that I thought was sort of odd with a convention that I was looking to cover. And I'm very transparent, so I'm going to kind of talk about it because I found it very, very bizarre. I would think other people would too. Anyway, so, but first, I do have some news. There was something that was breaking as I was out there shoveling snow. So I haven't put together any sort of images or anything like that to share, but there was some pretty bad news in the gaming industry that broke earlier today. And I've got the announcement from Mayfair Games, but before I get to that, Asmodee announced that they had acquired the German board and card game manufacturer, Lookout GmbH, publisher of Uwe Rosenberg's Agricola. It is also acquired the U.S. rights to the Lookout catalog, which was being released through Mayfair Games, because Mayfair Games is withdrawing from game publishing. And the Mayfair rights associated with non-Lookout games such as Lords of Vegas, Family Business, Steam, Downfall of Pompeii, Empire Builder, and some others, I don't have a full list, are actually going to uh, go to Asmodee. I do have the Mayfair Games announcement. As of today, the management team at Mayfair Games Inc. announces we will wind down game publishing. After 36 years, this was not an easy decision or one we took lightly, but it was necessary. Once we had come to this conclusion, we knew we had to find a good home for our games, which is when we reached out to Asmodee. We are pleased to announce that we have sold our games to Asmodee North America, who have acquired all the assets of Mayfair Games, Inc. This acquisition includes the product line for both Mayfair Games, Inc. and Lookout Games. We would like to take a moment to say, Thank you. 
Thank you to the many retailers, reviewers, customers, industry partners, and volunteers who made us a success over the past 36 years. You helped bring our games to game stores and cafes, conventions, libraries, schools, kitchen tables, backyard patios, family vacations, and more. Where thousands of fans have been introduced to this great world of board gaming. Thank you. I have to say, this did not come as a shock. Because if you follow The Daily Dope, if you watch regularly, I did talk about a few weeks ago that it was very, very strange how everything had kind of, about Mayfair Games had sort of gone poof. Their PR department was let go. Their marketing department was let go. So right there, I told you, I thought Asmodee was going to acquire the company. But I did think that maybe Mayfair would still stick around as far as, because, you know, Asmodee's bought other game companies and just kept everybody together, or a lot of people together, who were involved with the company. This doesn't look like this is the case. And it's doubly sad for me because I grew up with Mayfair and I recall Mayfair from their RPG products. Like they had the DC role-playing game. They had the Batman role-playing game, which was actually very cool. And I do recall Elliot Miller, my best friend who gets mentioned just about every day on the show over at voiceofe.com. He and I actually went to a diamond distributor kind of trade show that was in the Chicago suburbs years ago. We're talking years ago. I was in my very early 20s and Mayfair was there and Mayfair actually held a party. They threw a party and uh, it was pretty funny because it was all these, you know, comic book store owners and things like that. And here's (laughs) Elliot and I who we didn't belong there, but we were there anyway. And it was a great time, and the folks at Mayfair were always very cool. Having said that, over the past few years, you have sort of seen Mayfair be very hit or miss. And I'll even mention if you, because it's still there, if you visit the Mayfair Games website, the website looked like it was about a decade behind the times. And it seemed like Mayfair was spending way, way more time and energy into doing things like being a sponsor of Gen Con, which was great. And Mayfair always had their van out there and you could get coffee in the morning and free water. And every year we had the Mayfair Gen Con pins, which I don't know, I think I've got about eight of those. But it seemed like they were more focused on that than actually getting the games out there to the public, especially through their website. Because game companies cannot survive just by looking at selling product at Origins, Gen Con, and maybe a handful of other cons. That being said, I am really sad to hear that Mayfair is going to go the way of the Dodo. Like I said, it's, uh, gosh, you know, I, I've been following the company for a long, long time. Can't say I've always had a chance to review a lot of their games, but, you know, it's just sad. To me, it's just sad. And I know... There are probably going to be people out there who are going to be pretty upset, too, because I know a lot of folks are thinking, you know, Asmodee is becoming just this this massive company and uh, monopolies are never good, right? Set the pricing, you know, price as high as the public will possibly tolerate. So I don't know. I do not know. So, yes, uh, I'm not <laughs> I'm not wiping a tear. I have like a hair hanging down. I swear, what did I get? A haircut two weeks ago? And my hair's already a mess. I am a mess today, I have to say. I have had, (laughs) I've been out shoveling and thankfully I'm not all sweaty and stinky, but uh, yeah, I'm kind of all blah. In fact, I came in uh, from shoveling about five minutes before I sat down and started the stream. Hopefully, if you are watching live, there is chat. I'm only on YouTube today. Now, yesterday I only did YouTube because there's been this weird audio sync issue that happens. Not all the time, just every once in a while. And I thought, okay, I'm going to stream through YouTube only 
just directly from me as opposed to I usually stream Twitch and YouTube. And I thought, well, maybe it's this like third party that I'm using that's kind of messing it up. Well, it turned out it, it wasn't. But then when I tried to uh, set up the stream for Twitch today, it wasn't uh, it wasn't going through. It wasn't I don't know if they're having server issues or something like that. I don't know. But I only had a couple of minutes to get ready for the show. So I was like, OK, not messing with that. So I'm only on YouTube today. So uh, there is chat. So it is live. It is not on screen, but there is chat. So if you have a question, comment, anything like that, when I'm doing my review for Dance of the Fireflies, if you have a question, feel free to chime in. Just want to say hello. That's cool, too. <sighs> All right. I'm trying to settle in. Trying to settle in. Yesterday's show was crazy, too, because you'd have thought it was my first rodeo, and that was just... The date was wrong because it was, once again, one of these audio sync things right at the last minute. It's like, why is this out of sync when I do a test? I did do a test stream a few minutes earlier. Everything looked okay. Fingers crossed because I really don't want to have to download this video and fix it and everything else. All right. Anyway, so let's get into the news that I was prepared for. Not that that ever maybe counts for anything. But it is some better news. It's happier news as opposed to uh, Mayfair Games shutting their doors. Anyway, the well-received German board game Clans of Caledonia is going to be available soon here in the U.S. by way of ACD distribution. Now, I it is a Karma game, Karma Games game, I guess I would say. And the reason why I don't have the ACD distribution website in the images below is because it's uh, really a website that's set up for retailers. So you have to have an account if you want to learn more about the game. But that's okay, because I've got the dope. Clans of Caledonia is a mid to heavy economic game set in 19th century Scotland. At this time, Scotland made the transition from an agricultural to an industrialized country that heavily relied on trade and export. In the following years, food production increased significantly to feed the population growth. Linen was increasingly substituted by the cheaper cotton, damn you cotton, and raising sheep was given high importance. More and more distilleries were founded and whiskey became the premium alcoholic beverage in Europe. Players represent historic clans with unique abilities and compete to produce, trade, and export agricultural goods and, of course, whiskey. The game ends after five rounds. Each round consists of these three phases. One, players' turns. Two, production phase. Three, round scoring. Players take turns and do one of eight possible actions, from building to upgrading, trading, and exporting. When players run out of money, they pass and collect a passing bonus. In the production phase, each player collects basic resources, refined goods, and cash from their production units built on the game map. Each production unit built makes income visible on the player mat. Refined goods require the respective basic resource. And then the third phase. Players receive victory points depending on the scoring tile of the current round. The game comes with eight different clans, a modular board with 16 configurations, eight port bonuses, and eight round scoring tiles. Clans of Caledonia is for one to four players. I always like to hear when games have some solitaire element to it. It's for ages 12 and up and takes about a half hour to play per player. It will carry an MSRP of $69.99 when it arrives this March. I have heard through the grapevine that this is an interesting game, that it's very unique, and it uh, it's a good game. So I'm glad to see that uh, it is going to make an appearance here in the U.S. Very, very nice. So uh, I don't have an exact release date, but at least I had the MSRP. So that's cool. Now there is a Kickstarter that looks pretty unique, but I will have a bit of a caveat at the end of the news piece about it. 
and it is a tile placement Battle of Agincourt game, which is currently up for crowdfunding from first-timer Logos Games, and I have the dope. October 25th, 1415, France. The woods were still and full of mist. Silent hoods, silent hoods, duh. Silent hills stood watch. A muddy field waited for the battle to begin. Near the small village of Agincourt, two armies faced each other in the chill of the early morning. Archers, footmen, scouts, and cavalry ordered themselves for battle. The land was the prize that was sought. The cost must be paid in blood. Welcome to the Fields of Agincourt. Fields of Agincourt is a combative tile placement game for two to five players. The map will form as the game is played, with each player fighting for position for the final battle. The goal of the game is to defeat your enemies and claim the most victory points. Playing Fields of Agincourt consists of two game stages, marshalling the troops, Players take turns placing tiles, recruiting troops, and claiming bastions. Once all the tiles are placed, the final battle will begin. The final battle. Players are vying for superior battle positions within bastions. Contested bastions are resolved one at a time with the winning player receiving victory points. Player with the most victory points at the end of the game, what do you think happens? Of course, they win. I do have a very short Kickstarter video that I did want to share with you, so let's take a peek. Fields of Agincourt is for two to five players, ages eight and up, and plays in around 30 to 60 minutes. And I will say right now, if this game is coming out in the US, it is not going to be marketed for ages eight and up. I can tell you that right now. The project is approximately 16% funded as of this moment. And I believe it just started and you can reserve a copy of the retail edition at the $45 pledge level. Project runs through March 8th. I do have to point out, if you take a look at these images that are flashing past, well, they're not really flashing, they're not that fast. Logos Games is a first time Kickstarter company. They have no website. And to me, that's always a red flag sort of like, okay, you're looking to, to get thousands of dollars in funding to get a game out there and you couldn't spend 20 bucks to create a website. Now, I'm not trying to dissuade people from checking out this website, or not website, this Kickstarter. Duh, they don't have a website, Jeff. What's wrong with you? So I did put uh, Fields of Agincourt on the images. So if you want to go to Kickstarter and do a search, take a peek, that's cool. But... I have talked about before kind of red flags for Kickstarters and one of the biggest one is that there's no website. There's Twitter and there's Facebook. Don't know. It does look interesting though. It does look kind of interesting and maybe even kind of a kind of a war game-ish introduction for folks who maybe don't war game. I don't know. My next news piece is another Kickstarter. But I will point out this company has had other Kickstarters which successfully funded and have been delivered and it looks really cool. So I do want to share this and I really don't have any qualms about sharing this either. <laughs> 
And it's from a company that I'm really not familiar with. It is Board and Dice. And they have a really interesting looking solitaire one page adventure game system, which is up for crowdfunding on Kickstarter. And it really caught my eye. For one, it's a bit of a double dip of gaming, and it's entitled Page Quest Season 1. And I have the dope. Page Quest Season 1 Mythical Artifacts is the biggest solo print-and-play adventure where you can find deep story and challenging gameplay. We want to welcome you to our next board and dice project. Here you will find two titles, that's why I said it's a double dip, under a single brand called the Page Quest series. These are A4 Quest and Page Quest Mythical Artifacts. Both games build on the same mechanic, but each will provide you with something different. First of all, you'll get a printed version of the already well-known game A4 Quest. Okay, you're not that well-known because uh, I never heard of it. Anyway, it has already succeeded in the print and play world and DICE, and, uh, I believe, oh, you know what? Damn it. Duh. <laughs> I'm like, hey, how come this didn't change over to what I'm talking about? You stupid computer. Anyway, back to what I was saying. A4 Quest, which has succeeded already in the print and play world by offering an engaging gameplay that fits on a single A4 printed sheet. You don't need to prepare anything once it's printed. It's ready to be played. Additionally, you will be able to get access to our brand new project, which we hope will become huge and epic, called Page Quest Mythical Artifacts. This will be available as a monthly subscription of print and play materials. These will form something like a TV show aired in the even time frames. A4 Quest is a solo adventure game in which you face hordes of monsters while experiencing locations. You experience locations? Your goal is to complete specific tasks while making sure that you stay alive. What is Page Quest Mythical Artifacts? Our idea is to offer you at least a six month subscription in which at least once a month, in the first week of the month, you will get an email from us with access to new game content. In these six months, you will be reliving with us new adventures in which you will be acquiring new, unique, almost mythical artifacts. Wait a second, so shouldn't the game be called Almost Mythical Artifacts? Each episode will fit on one A4 sheet, which can be printed so that you can enjoy the game right away. All you'll need to do is pick your hero and arrange a few D6s and you are ready to go. There's no cutting involved, so you can play directly on the printed sheet. Although, feel free to fold it so you can fit it in your pocket. Also, if you get the printed version of the A4 Quest, you will be able to use it in Page Quest, so nothing will be needed to be prepared. There is a quick Kickstarter video that I did want to share, and I really have to say, I think they've done a really nice job over at Board and Dice to create this video it's pretty impressive page quest season one mythical artifacts arpa needs you they are looking for brave new people to help them collect all the mythical artifacts spread around the globe so join us in this epic adventure and let the scavenging for artifacts begin a classic platformer brought to the world of board games page quest is a game that fits on a single page the dice management system used in the game allows you to spend your dice to perform activities like fighting, hunting, or exploring. It's simple to learn, but rife with critical decisions and tough choices. Also, like every great platformer, is dynamic and exciting. Page Quest offers a unique approach to gameplay. Divided into episodes, it will be delivered straight to your email account. Once a month, you will receive new content. Just print and you're ready to play. Simple as that, no special preparations necessary. Page Quest uses mechanisms based on A4 Quest, a popular print and play game downloaded over 15,000 times. And it's all thanks to the clever mechanism 
that fits on a single page. But PageQuest is also much more than its predecessor. Offering character development over time, the game will require you to make important decisions between the adventures covered in an engaging story. Now, everything is up to you. Make a pledge on your Kickstarter campaign and support PageQuest to see how far the first season will go and how many thrilling episodes you will see and star in. I wasn't kidding. I think that looks <laughs> really interesting. I do point out that uh, I really don't do the print and play, and I'll talk about that in just a second. You can score the print and play of Page Quest Season 1 for a $15 pledge. You can receive the printed edition, so no print and play there. You can get the printed edition of A4 Quest for a $15 pledge, or you can get a combination of both for a $22 pledge. Page Quest Mythical Artifacts is fully funded and will run through February 28th with an expected delivery in June. Huh. I don't have anything against print and play games. None whatsoever. Very cool. I, I know a lot of times, a lot of games are going to start off as, yes, uh, Aiden Brandt. Yes, it does sound cool. Aiden uh, is chiming in. Uh, hopefully, I think he's... Do I recommend it? I don't know. I haven't played it. I know nothing about it. I don't know anything about board and dice as far as as a company. But I will point out that it is a company that has had other Kickstarters in the past, have been successful, and they've delivered on it, on them, I should say. But uh, the reason why I don't do uh, reviews of print and play, and I've had tons and tons of companies ask me to do reviews of their print and play stuff. It's because, you know what? I do one and then I have to do all of them. <laughs> you know, that's kind of, yeah, I can't tell a company, well, no, I don't do reviews for print and play products and then turn around and do some reviews for some and then say, well, no, I don't do print and play products. Once again, I always point out that uh, the gaming gang, as well as, of course, the Daily Dope, operates on a budget that makes a shoestring look like a cable holding up the San Francisco Bridge. I know some of you are out there thinking, okay, so this is Family Fun Friday. You've had kind of a war game. You've got a heavy sort of Euro economic game. Now you've got this solitaire game. How about some family game news? Well, I've got your family game news right here because my friends over at North Star Games have announced a new imprint for the company, which is going to focus on, at least I believe it will focus on, light children slash family games. And the company is titled, or I should say the imprint is titled Happy Planet. Wait, what? Uh... Doesn't the gang at North Star watch the news? A more apt name would be Planet in Turmoil. Nah, I'm just kidding. Well, it wouldn't be much of an imprint without games, and I have the dope on two of them coming soon. The first off, the first of them, I was starting to say first off, and then I'm like, the first off. The first is Funky Chicken. And it's coming soon to a chicken coop near you. Dubbed the spiritual successor of Happy Salmon, Funky Chicken replaces Happy Salmon celebrations with funky dance moves. You'll be spinning in place, hip bumping, swinging with your partner, and of course, doing the iconic Funky Chicken. Here's how you play. At the same time, everyone calls out the action shown on their top card. When two players have a match, they frolic, ooh, frolicking, by performing that action together, then discard their top card. They keep doing this. First player to discard all of their cards will win. Play Funky Chicken by itself or combine it with the Green Happy Salmon to create a fin-flapping, feather-flying good time. It will contain 72 cards, one rule book, a pretty cool looking funky chicken pouch which is also great for crossing the road 
Funky Chicken is for three to six players ages six and up and will strut its stuff in April. Then we've got Monster Mash. That's right, they did the mash. I'm sorry, I, it's not Monster Mash, it's Monster Match. So it's, I'm sitting there thinking, oh yeah, so I can kind of sing the uh, Monster Match. Oh, they did the match. They did the Monster Match. And stupid me goes, yeah, mash. <laughs> Ruined that joke. Nice going, Jeff. Anyway. In the town of Sprinkleton, monsters are running rampant and stealing all of the donuts. We need your help. Monster Match is the screaming fast game of catching cute donut eating monsters. Players roll the special monster dice and then race to find a monster that matches the dice rolled. How fast can you find a monster with three eyes or four arms? With each monster worth different donut points, do you search for just any matching monster, or do you try to find the monster with the most donuts? Well, watch out. Go too fast. You might catch the wrong monsters and lose your donuts. It contains 55 monster cards, two monster dice, one zilch token, zip zilch nada, one rule book, a cool looking monster match pouch, which it looks like it zips across its mouth so that uh, the teeth are actually the zipper. And of course, the pouch is perfect for when you're on the run. Monster Match will look to gobble your donuts this April and is for two to six players, ages six and up. I don't have any MSRPs for either title just yet. I'm gonna take a guess. You're gonna be right in the range of the similarly packaged Happy Salmon. So probably somewhere between about $15 and $20. So not too shabby. The I, Happy Salmon, I've never played it. I have not played it. I know it has been phenomenally successful for North Star Games. So uh, yes, Aiden, well, thanks for tuning in and uh, popping out here, saying hello. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, anyway, so... Um, so yeah, uh, it's kind of cool that uh, now North Star Games is going to sort of have an imprint for their family-friendly games, their children's games as well. Nice! And of course, once I know more about uh, the MSRPs, I will share that with you. Okay, so that is it for the news today. I do want to point out there are some sales going on that you may want to take a look at. First off, Victory Point Games is uh, starting a Valentine's Day sale. It began today because Victory Point Games loves you. They love you. And it will run through February 16th. And at the moment, you can save 10% off almost everything in the VictoryPointGames.com store outside of, I believe, Darkest Night. Well, I know Darkest Night is not part of it, but I don't think there were any other restrictions. I think it's 10% off all the rest of the games. Also, there is a uh, superhero RPG sale going on over at Drive-Thru RPG. You can save 25% off hundreds of superhero-related role-playing game products. And of course, whenever I mention drive through RPG, I always point out that uh, if you are swinging over there, please stop by the GamingGang.com beforehand, click on one of our drive through banners. And if you do make a purchase, we'll actually get a yeah, little bit of it. And uh, I just did a review for Tiny Dungeon 2nd Edition yesterday from Gallant Night Games. And I was able to pick that up through funds that... Uh, like I said, they all add up, all adds up. Can't expect every role-playing game company out there to be sending me free PDFs and things like that. Of course, the ones that do are awfully cool. So very, very nice. All right, so that is it for the news today. I've got a few other items that I'm gonna talk about a little bit, and then I am going to jump into my Dance of the Fireflies review. So if you are curious what's cooking for next week, I like to give people kind of a heads up so that they know uh, what they can look forward to. So on Monday, I will be reviewing 
Rail Raiders Infinite from Soda Pop Miniatures and Ninja Division. And I would love to get like some minis, do some mini reviews and stuff on Mondays. And uh, this has miniatures. Ha ha ha. So I'm going to do a review of that. We got, we've only gotten one game in so far of it. Then, yeah, I was talking about how Darkest Night isn't part of the sale. Ugh, ugh, as I throw my back out. <laughs> well, it's not part of the sale, but uh, I will be reviewing this on Tuesday's edition of The Daily Dope. So you're certainly going to want to tune in for that. It is a big monster game. It's a pretty heavy box, too. Then on Wednesday... Like I said, I swear it, it's it's almost as if GMT Games is just, it's not going to be War Game Wednesday, it's just going to be GMT Wednesday. We're going to take a look at Space Empire's Replicators. It's the second expansion for Space Empire's 4X. So I will be taking a look at that on Wednesday. I will also announce the winner for Wing Leader Blitz. The Wing Leader Expansion Blitz 1939 to 1942 on Wednesday's show. Give you a hint on how you can still get into the running to win. Simply go and check out um, either my video for two weeks back when I reviewed this War of Mine. Or you can take a look at this Wednesday's video. <laughs> Yes, indeedy, and find out how you can how you can win it. In case you were wondering uh, what this Wednesday's video was, I did a how to play on Twilight Struggle. So very, very cool. All right, so I mentioned um, I was going to talk about this convention, and I'm not going to harp on this. I just I just wanted to mention something because I thought it was weird. Okay, so I thought this was really strange because normally conventions want the gaming gang to come out and cover them. I get invites to all these various different conventions of all different sizes all around the country. And uh, unfortunately, it's just not within my budget to go out and cover them. So, you know, my, my last name isn't Gates or Buffett. But yeah, I usually put it in the convention news. So I usually have it in our listing of conventions and stuff. So anyway, so I'm thinking recently I thought yeah you know what I should really try to look at some of the uh, some of the smaller conventions because we go we're at Origins we're at San Diego Comic Con we're at Gen Con I've been out to uh, Con Sim World Expo on Tempe so you know we, we try to try to cover conventions when we can so I thought you know there are some some interesting conventions that are in the Chicago area and I knew that there was a science fiction convention coming up next weekend in a suburb just outside Chicago. And uh, somebody on, twi uh, on Twitter had actually mentioned that they were the person who is the gaming contact, because I guess they've got a 24-hour gaming area. And uh, they, they, they've got some gaming guests and things like that. Timothy Zahn is their like guest of honor this year. And it's it's like the 38th or 39th uh, annual convention, right? So it's been around for quite some time. So I reached out to the gaming contact and I said, hey, you know, you're probably not familiar with my website, but yeah, we'd love to come out and, and cover the convention. And I, I got an email back and young woman said, oh yeah, that's great, that sounds awesome, but I'm not the person to contact, but I forwarded on your info to the person, uh, two people who you probably, one of them you're, is the one you need to talk to. I'm like, okay. So anyway, some time goes by, I didn't hear anything back. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. Yeah, no biggie. And then I get an email from one of these people that are a marketing person and uh, sort of like, you know, kind of like, you know, I don't know, what, what are you trying to do here? What, what, are you, what are you looking to do? Now, of course, I had spelled all this out an email to their gaming contact that got forwarded on, right? Just your traditional convention coverage, right? You know, do some interviews with people, you know, kind of show off what was going on. You know, most small shows, they love having press. I know it's weird to say press, media, whatever you want to say. 
Uh, but they love having folks like us come out because then it generates interest into attendance the next year. Well, this, this convention doesn't seem to have really any coverage that I've seen, right, outside of their own website. So anyway, so the marketing person is kind of has this attitude of like, yeah, I, yeah, I'd like to work with you, but, uh, you know, what do you want? Kind of like, this is like your 38th, 39th year doing this show. You've never dealt with like press before. What's going on? So I, you know, I'm like, okay, whatever. Yeah, people could be new. You never know. So I kind of laid out, hey, this is what we're looking to do. Come, you know, try to set up some interviews with some of your guests and kind of get a feel and share, you know, share what's going on with, with the convention and so, so on and so forth. A few days go by, still haven't heard anything. And now remember, this is next week. So if I were going to go and cover this show, I got to make sure one of my correspondents who is a videographer for the gaming gang at some of the conventions is going to be available to go with me. So I reached out and just said, Hey, um, you know, if you don't want us to come, that's cool. Don't worry about it. But if you are considering doing this, you gotta let me know. Cause I don't want to have to wait till last minute and the night before be told, Oh yeah, you got press credentials. Origins did that to me one year. They told me two days before, two or three days before the show started. Oh yeah, hey, by the way, you're approved for your press credentials. Is like, well, I'm not going. What are you? What are you crazy? So anyway, so uh, so I get this email back, and it's basically so you, you would think I was asking this person, hey, you need to pay me to come out there and cover your show. Which of course, that's not how we do things. I don't charge people to review their games and stuff like that. Why would I? I mean, crazy, right? And uh, the comment was, he, the, the person's email really was like, you know, I'm really concerned that if you, if you came to the show to cover the show, that, uh, you know, I was looking at some of your convention coverage and it, you only talk to gaming people. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. The, the more recent conventions were gaming conventions. So, of course, you're going to talk to gaming people at gaming conventions just like you would talk to comic book people at comic book conventions plus i pointed out uh hey you do realize that i have interviewed timothy zahn in the past for my website so anyway so and it's kind of like you know oh well you know i'd really like to talk to you on the phone about this i thought you know what this is just too much hassle i can't believe you know you're gonna make me jump through hoops san diego comic-con doesn't make me jump through hoops like this. Gen Con, Origin, nobody. Little shows are like, oh, please, could you could you come up to Wisconsin or come to Michigan to cover our show? So I finally just uh, emailed back and I said, you know what? Um, yeah, this is just a big hassle, it seems like. So, no, that's okay. Don't worry about it. It's kind of like... And the thing that really struck me is this convention has been around for a long time, but it gets a really small crowd. It's not a big, huge show, right? Probably about 1,000 people is what I, they claim their attendance has been. And we know conventions usually <clears throat> aren't 100% uh, honest about their attendance. So I thought, well, geez, man, I guess, I guess you guys aren't really interested in growing this convention at all. So I just thought that was very, very bizarre. I just thought it was very strange because the whole underlying sort of thing with the, the emails back and forth with this person was like I was asking them to pay me. I don't know. I don't get it. So anyway, so yeah, just really strange. So if uh, if anybody's out there and you get like a small, it doesn't have to be small. I mean, if you have a convention that's in, you know, the Chicago area or Illinois or something like that, and you'd like coverage from the gaming gang, just ask. I mean, it's not like it's like, hey, That'll be, uh, let's see, uh, you want us to cover it for two days? It's 500 times two. No, nothing like that. All right, so anyway, so I have Dance of the Fireflies. It is from Backspinal Games and Ninja Division. And we are going to move on over to the other camera to take a look. Dance of the Fireflies is for two to six players ages 14 and up and that's because of the components that are in this game that's the only reason why it's rated for ages 14 and up 
Now there are varying different uh, play times that are indicated both on, on the rules, on the box, online. It's like 15 to 30, 30 to 45, so on and so forth. Really, the game time is gonna break down because of the number of players. So it's really gonna depend on the number of players that you have. Dance of the Fireflies is designed by Oliver Brooks with art from Amber Grundy and Victoria C. Hackett. I did point out it is from Backspindle Games and it's released through Ninja Division and it does carry a family-friendly MSRP of $24.95. All right, so the premise of uh, Dance of the Fireflies, and I should say that uh, in, in the box itself, there are rules for in English as well as German. And we have the player aid cards here in both English as well as German. The German rules. So because that is uh, what we've got, I'm going to do my review in German. So no, I am absolutely not going to do that. I already told tell you guys all the time, I treat the English language as if it's a second language. All right, so the premise of Dance of the Fireflies is that the royal horticulturist is retiring. They're stepping down. So they need a replacement. So all the various apprentices are kind of battling it out to create the most beautiful gardens so they can be named as the new... And I apologize, I noticed there's a bit of glare coming off of there. So let's see, eh, it looks like everywhere I go it's going to be some glare. Yeah, oh well, sorry. Uh, I, space is always at a premium here, so... But anyway, so uh, you'll have uh, all the various players, two to, f two to six I should say, who are looking to compete to be named the new royal horticulturist. And to do so, they're going to create the most beautiful garden possible. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you kind of uh, the anatomy of a card. And one of the interesting things about Dance of the Fireflies is depending on how many players you have will determine how many cards you'll have in the deck. Now there are six colors of flowers. So even with fewer players, you'll still have a mixture of the different colors. So if we take a peek at this card, and I'll kind of hold it there for a sec, make sure we get it actually in focus, you'll notice that there's a number in the upper right corner. So that number indicates, will this card be part of the deck with six players? Just like I've got a card here. It shows that it's a four, so with a game of four or more players, this card would be included in the mix. If not, you're gonna take those cards out. And there are quite a lot of cards. Now these are the cards, I just kind of set this up as if you were gonna play, say a three player game. So that's quite a lot of cards right there. But we already have a deck that's set up for a three player game. All right. Let's go back, taking a look at the card itself. So we're, we have this really, the artwork throughout is really nice. And I had originally heard that this is, you know, this is a nice, relaxing kind of set collection game. And yes, I, I guess that's true. <laughs> uh, probably not as relaxing as I had thought, which is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. Now, I, I, I'm sure people will find it relaxing, but I, I like some of the little take that mechanics that are in this game. But anyway, so taking a look, you'll see that, and it might be a little bit difficult to make out, but near that four plus, you'll see there's kind of a little like sun. So that's gonna tell you that this is a sunshine flower. This, this flower blooms in the sun effectively. If you look at the upper left corner, you're gonna see that's color, right? So we're seeing this is a red flower, but the kind designers over at Backspindle Games realize that there are people who are colorblind. So you see there's kind of a, almost looks like a crow, this icon here. 
each color also shows the icon. So if someone were to happen to be colorblind, they can still easily play this game because of the different iconography that is on the card. But that was that was very thoughtful of Backspindle Games because you do encounter games where there's a lot of color coding. And it's sort of like, but uh, what if someone were colorblind? Next thing we're going to take a look at at this card, of course, we're going to tell you what it is. So this is a field poppy. And then we're going to see these little circles below with more iconography on them. There are three different circles like this. So we see at the far right, that is the moon. And then these two other circles, they are mixed. So it is night or day. So that can be considered either or. Let's take a quick peek at the sunflower. As we can see here, obviously it's a sunflower, so the sunflower is going to show a sun sign. But here, this one's showing one of each. So we've got day, a mix, as well as night. This is a night flower. So if you notice, it's a different color. It's a white flower, and it's got the different icon up there. But we also see where it shows by the four plus, there's a moon. So that shows that this is a moon flower. And I'll explain what that means in just a few moments. But here we see that there's the two mixed as well as the one sun in these circles here. All right, then there's another card which I will talk about in a little more depth. This card is known as the Orchid slash Weed card. So this card actually is a multi-purpose card. It can be utilized in two different ways. And when we get to that, I will actually discuss that. Thankfully, we've got our little scoring cards. And really what you're looking to do is you're trying to assemble flower beds of six flowers. And to do that, you'll have to have one flower of each of the six colors. So we see her on the scoring that talks about the flower bed. So if there's six flowers, five, four, three, two, one. Talks about there's, oh, look, there's a purple flower bonus. So if you have a flower bed that includes a purple flower, that's going to give you a bonus. There's harmony bonuses as well. So if you have six flowers of each color and they're all day you get bonus points and if they all happen to be night you get more bonus points then on the back it is going to tell you each of these flowers has a special ability and this is where one of the really cool aspects of dance of the fireflies will come into play we'll kind of talk about these special abilities abilities in just a moment so you're going to set up the game like i said i've got this set up for three players this would look a little bit different if you had four five or six players you would actually have eight flowers here each of the players is going to get three cards to start off with a hand and they're also going to get six of these colored discs so you're going to pick color and that is what you're going to get. So these represent fireflies. These fireflies are here to help you plant your flowers and to be able to get these flowers into your flower beds. So you're going to have six regular fireflies and then you have a firefly that has a crown. This is a royal firefly. This is a very important firefly, very valuable firefly. So each of the players will have that. Then you'll have your hand of three cards. There is a hand limit. You can only have three cards in your hand at any one time. This is the compost heap. So this is really where you'll put your discards. Your discards will go into the compost heap. Then this is our deck that we've actually set up here. 
So this is where your deck will go. And then this is the greenhouse. And this is where weeds will go. When you draw a weed. This is really kind of a set collecting uh, kind of auction game because you'll be bidding on the different flowers. But because the flowers have these special abilities that you can utilize when you plant a flower, it's got a lot of cool wrinkles to it. So this is the sundial here, and the sundial is going to maneuver around during each turn. And if we take a close look, pop that out, you'll see that we've got this upper end is the day side, and this is the night side. Because remember I was talking about these icons and these flowers are day as well as night. So, to begin, you're actually going to remove, let's say, for a three-player game, or whatever number of players you have, you're going to go through the deck of cards, and you're going to remove any number higher than the number of players. And that's why I say that there's different indications of how long this game will take to play, because depending on the number of players, of course, more players means it's going to take a little bit more time. But it's not going to take a whole lot of time. This is not a game that's going to take forever to play. Even with six players. Now, the first time you play, yes, it might take a little bit more than an hour. But you're never going to... Once, once everybody has an idea of what's going on with the game, six players should finish up in under an hour. Probably close to about the 45 minute. So you're gonna start off and the recommendation is everybody takes a firefly, they hold it up and they drop it. They hold it up above this sundial and then they drop it and whoever's closest to it is the first player or considered they're the, the apprentice for that turn. I don't know. <laughs> these are circular, these do roll. So it's very easy to have one of these start rolling off and you don't wanna lose them because there are not extras in the box. And these are the colors for the other players. So there's three more colors here. Okay, so to start off, as I mentioned, you're gonna get your uh, you're gonna get your three cards. You got your fireflies, and you're going to have your first player. So the first thing that's gonna happen by the first player is you have a planting phase. So what you can do, and I'm I'm gonna show off this hand of cards for the first player. And yeah, we'll do the sundial like that. All right, so you're going to have a hand of three cards. These three flowers, if you really want to plant a flower, you may spend one of your fireflies. You can say, yes, I'm gonna spend this flower, ah, firefly to plant one of these flowers. So it's a red, a purple, and a white. When you plant your flower in a flower bed, and of course you're going to need some space, <laughs> right? Because you're going to have these different flower beds. When you plant a flower in your flower bed, you may use that special ability. So for an example, if I wanted to plant this, I could say, oh, okay, I'm going to use one of my fireflies, I'm gonna plant this red flower, it's the first flower I'm getting, and that tells you what you're allowed to do. Right, so red says, draw two cards from the potting shed, which is here, and add them to your hand, then select any one card from your hand and discard it face down to the bottom of the potting shed. So that's red, a white, flyer, white flower allows you to place one firefly from your supply onto any available space on any flower in the flower clock. This, these six cards, make up the flower clock. A yellow flower allows you to copy the special ability of any red, white, orange, or blue face-up flower already in a flower bed where it's planted. Then you've got the orange. You can place one additional flower from your hand in your flower bed and you don't have to spend the firefly. Then you got blue, select one card from your compost heap 
from the compost heap, I should say, and add it to your hand. Keeping in mind that you, you are not going to have like these massive hands of cards. Okay, so, <clears throat> so that would be an option in the planting phase, right? So I can plant a flower by spending one of my fireflies, but then I lose that firefly. I don't get that firefly anymore. Okay, so that firefly has to stay on that flower. Well, got to keep in mind, you'll have, you've got a limited supply of fireflies. So you're only going to do that normally if you really, really want to get a flower from your hand into one of your flower beds. Because you can have more, you, I shouldn't say could, you will have more than one flower bed because you can only have one of each color in the flower bed. You cannot have two red flowers in a flower bed. Now you do not have to complete a, a flower bed before you begin a new one. So that's important to keep in mind too, because when we first played it, one of the players thought, oh, well, how can I be starting a new flower bed? I haven't finished up the one I've got. And it's like, no, you don't have to. You can start as many flower beds as you want. So it turned out you're like, oh, I got all these red flowers. Sure, you're gonna have different flower beds. Okay, so for an example, so you could conceivably plant one of the flowers. What you can do is you can also bid on one of the flowers around the flower clock. So in order to do this, See, this is the day side. So we're like this, right? So we're like, this is the day side. And this is the night side. So anything, so you see here, this is day. Got to look kind of close. Because, whoops. Because this little arm here, you would think, oh, it's straight across, right? Oh, okay, I get it. Well, you have to look here because... That is showing that it's day. That is showing this part here past this is night. So when you're pointing it like this, right? You're pointing it between, the, you know, it's aimed at the cards. This is day. This is night because it's falling into the night. So when you're bidding one of your fireflies, if it's in the day side, you would end up having to put it on either a mix or day, just like so. So for an example, this card here, this orange card, you could put it here or here. Can't put it there because it's night. And the same will work as far as the night side. And what you need to do is you actually will fill these up from, uh, I shouldn't say you're gonna fill them up because you don't always fill them up. But you're gonna actually sit there and you're going to put your firefly down on the card. So like so, here you might decide, oh, well, you know, I wanna, well, that wouldn't really matter. You could do that, okay? All right, so anyway, moving right along. Um, because when you're actually placing them, you, uh, you're looking at the flower up here too, right? So this is going to be, this is a day flower. This is a day flower. That's a day flower. That's a day flower. That's a night flower. That's a day flower. Because these flowers are going to bloom. So as an example, so we'll say that, that is that player's turn and then okay if you want what you can do is if you place a firefly or plant a flower you can decide well I'm going to discard one of my cards into the compost heap and it allows you to place another firefly if you want so let's say for an example we go around the table here and 
first player says, okay, well, I'm going to... I'm going to bid on this flower here. I'm bidding on the sunflower. And then the next player, say they're the blue player, they say, okay, uh, I'm going to bid on this. Now, the thing is, when you have... Hi, Jeff, great review. Normally the flower cards face out, so it's easier to place the fireflies. Yeah, okay, fine. Fine backspindle games. <laughs> fine. Jumping in here. Yeah, that is a good point. I am kind of trying to squeeze everything in <laughs> on this small, small area here. All right, so... So anyway, so send, then let's say the brown player here decides, oh, well, you know what? I want to play uh, one of my cards, but I want to plant it. And they're like, oh, well, I want to get that purple bonus. This is just an example, right? I'm not saying somebody would do this. So they say, okay, well, boom, I'm going to do that. Okay? So that's that would be it. I mean, if somebody's not going to discard a card to get an extra one to drop down now it would be possible because you're going to go around and then players have an opportunity to pass once everybody passes then of course then that route that planting phase is going to be over so what you end up doing is you'll see like in a situation like that well that blue player is probably going to sit there and say well you know what i want that card so I am going to discard one of my cards into, whoops, sorry, keep going to the wrong one, into the compost heap. And I'm going to use my bonus action to place that. So once everybody's gone and they've everybody's done their planting phase, the person who is the apprentice, they're effectively the first player, they're going to move the sundial and what will happen here is that if that flower is see this is a sunflower this is a daytime flower if it's in daytime then that flower blooms so that means that flower can actually be be taken and in an example like this the blue player would be getting this flower but here's the thing it's night so this is not going to bloom everybody has a royal firefly only one you only get the one royal firefly in the bidding process the royal firefly trumps everyone else so let's say for an example we've got this and we've got that so when you use the royal firefly you are never going to reveal that crown when you bid what i recommend players do because you're competing with your other players right hello sarah from ninja division Hello, Sarah Jones. Great, now the pressure's on me here. Anyway, uh, so as far as the with the Royal Fireflies, as I said, they trump other bids. So as an example here, now where did I put it? Right here? Nope. Right here, okay. So what I recommend players do is <clears throat> kind of keep your Fireflies off to the side now, of course, once if you were to plant a flower using a firefly, well, that firefly is going to stay there for the rest of the game. But you would be amazed at how many people will sit there and, okay, because at times you'll have your royal firefly on the sundial and uh, people will watch you go, okay. And then they'll keep an eye out <laughs> on when do you, where do you put this? Right? It ha I'm, tr I'm telling you, people do it all the time. Clever players, I mean, I'd be the first one. To, this is why I'm telling you that, because I was kind of keeping my eyes peeled 
on the other players when they would get their royal firefly back and then they go oh, okay there we go so what i recommend is when you're deciding that you're going to do your bidding pick up your royal fire your royal firefly if it's available to you and the rest of your fireflies have them in your hand and then be like ah oh, okay and then do your bid right because it's secret, it's hidden, it's secret. You don't know, you're not supposed to know that that Royal Firefly is there. So what you'll see happen is you'll have other players, uh, let's use that. Where's the Royal Firefly for blue? Here we go. Got that. And we got that. Okay. so. The three players, everybody's in the running. Everybody wants this card. Man, this is a this is the most beautiful flower I've ever seen. I need to have that flower. Well, what will happen is if both players or two players have placed the Royal Firefly on the card, it basically means that those two Royal Fireflies were too busy fighting over that flower. They were they were too distracted and this player would actually win the card when that card would bloom right remember it would have to be whoops like so because remember this is night only time it's gonna the flowers bloom is during the correct time uh now the one thing it's sort of like okay well you don't get completely ripped off as far as you got nothing, you actually have the opportunity to, if your Royal Fireflies ended up dueling it out, then you don't get that card, but you're able to plant one of the cards that's in your hand. So you don't get completely burned, but what will happen anytime that you use your Royal Firefly, as far as bidding, you're going to put the Royal Fireflies down on the sundial upside down. So then the next time when this moves again, you're going to flip those up. The next time this will move again, each of the players will be able to get these back. That's only with the Royal Fireflies. Other Fireflies, once you've got these out and you're bidding on the different flowers, once that flower is won, you would get your fireflies back. So you, you never lose the ability to use the fireflies unless you use the firefly to plant the flower. When a flower is gained from the flower clock, you're going to plant it. So it's gonna go in your garden, right? You're gonna be, well, see now, what do we see here? Just as an, uh, let me move this a little bit. Like I said, space is at a premium. So we're saying that this is, this is the flower bed, right? So one of the first things I had mentioned was you cannot have more than one of a particular color in a flower bed. But I also said, you don't have to wait until you have a full six color flower bed to plant a new flower bed. So in a situation where if this was the player who won that, you're gonna start a new flower bed. And then of course you would replace the card on the flower clock that was played. Now there's another little tricky thing that you can do if you would like. And it's one of the kind of take that mechanics that I like about this, which I think is pretty cool, is you can utilize your Royal Firefly you say, okay, I'm using my Royal Firefly, pop it there, and you can swap positions of two cards if you want. So if you say, for an example, one of the players is like, yeah, they're really heavily invested in a card, which you should never be totally, totally invested in a card because there are six colors. I mean, come on. But if somebody's like, oh, wow, you know, you can tell they're really waiting to try to get this other card. What you can do is you just spend that Royal Firefly and you, you're gonna switch places and you can move it further back. You can move it further away from it blooming. Or you could conceivably take it and move it 
all the way to another side. Because remember, you got the day and night. It's very important to remember the day and night. So because you're using your fireflies in the planting phase, you can easily sit there and kind of, uh, ah, what's a family friendly word I could use? Mess your opponent out of getting a card that they've been sitting there waiting to get because you would move it away from when this card is going to be harvest, harvested. Okay, so as far as that goes, remember when you're planting your flowers, you get to take the special ability as long as it's being placed into a flower bed that you already have. So that's important to remember as well. So you're just going to continue to go around and once once you say you use a card you're also going to make sure that you draw back up to three cards in your hand. So you always have the three cards at the end of your turn. So next time, next person who's going to be the apprentice because this will move around the table, everybody's going to make sure that before that next turn Everybody's got three cards. Now, the way the first player marker works is, yes, there you go. Oh, yes, swapping two cards can be pure evil genius. Yes, you see, and that's why when I started off the review, I said, oh, I was told this is, you know, this nice, relaxing set collection game. And I was like, yeah, I guess it could be. So this, this first player moves around differently. It doesn't just go clockwise or counterclockwise. What will happen is at the end of your harvest phase, when you're getting ready for, okay, well, we're gonna start a new round, new planting phase. Whoever has the fewest flowers planted becomes the first player. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit of a catch up mechanic. It's not a huge catch up mechanic. But it is a nice little way to kind of keep everybody in the mix. Because, you know, there's a lot of games where you'll be playing and suddenly somebody jumps out to a big lead and everybody else around the table is like, well, pff, all right, I guess we're going to just sit around here and finish this up, huh? Yeah, okay. This sort of alleviates that a little bit. Because remember, you can discard a card from your hand to get that extra firefly that you can place on one of the flowers of the flower clock. Now there is a flower. Now it's already mixed into this deck because as I said, I set this up for a three player game. There's another really interesting flower that is not going to start in the player's hands or in the flower clock at the beginning but it is the weed slash orchid card. So the weed slash orchid card is mixed into the deck. So when you're drawing to get your hand back up to three, if you get one of these weed orchid cards, they go into the greenhouse. Now, if you were replacing one of these flowers that had already been harvested and you drew because you're going to go day and the night. So when you replace, you always replace the day card first and then the night side card. But let's say for an example, you drew the orchid slash weed card. Well, then yes, then it would go there. If that's not the case and you have a weed orchid card and the harvest phase comes around and the player who bid, oh, okay, so I got that flower. Rather than drawing, you're going to replace it with this. And it can be utilized as either an orchid, like so. And if you take a look, you'll see it's kind of a wild flower. It can represent any one of the six colors. Now, I will point out that if you are able to win the orchid slash weed card, that when you plant it, you don't get the special ability of the weed card. The other thing is, if you take it and use it as a weed card, you plant this in someone else's garden. 
You don't pl obviously you're not going to plant weeds in your own garden. What kind of master horticulturist are you going to be if you're planting weeds in your garden? And what the weed card does, it prevents the player from being able to assemble a six flower bed with all six colors because this counts as a flower and you can only have six flowers in your flower bed. So this is another kind of cool little take that mechanic that you utilize on the other players. But just because somebody plants a weed in your flower bed doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be stuck with that weed in your flower bed. Because remember, these flowers all have different abilities. So, remember, we have, uh, where was it now? Come on, where is it? I know you can remove it from your... Yeah, it's the orange one. Oh, that's why it is. Okay, duh. So, the orange flower card allows you to plant an additional flower in your bed. So when you plant an orange flower card, it allows you to plant another flower. So that actually means that you can replace that weed. Now, if that weed comes out of your flower bed, that weed can also go into another player's flower bed. It doesn't get discarded. It gets the weeds go moving around because weeds go from garden to garden, right? Okay, so uh, as far as kind of like resolving ties, if you were sitting here with the uh, the various different flowers, so what'll happen here is let's say everybody had bid on this card, but they all used just regular fireflies, right? Okay, so when this got turned to here, both this card and this card would consider to have bloomed, right? Because this is in day, this is in night. There's no bids on this card, so this, this card isn't, nothing's going to happen. So this card's going to actually go to the compost heap and get replaced. If it situation like this where you've got all three players are tied same thing's gonna happen nobody's gonna win this card and everybody's gonna get their fireflies back and this card goes to the compost heap this helps kind of speed the game along because otherwise if you just had to sit there and everybody had to have fireflies on the different cards and then if you don't have anything it just keeps sitting out there the end game mechanic is when you run out of cards from the potting shed. So there are, even with a three-player game, there's still quite a few cards in this deck. So if you weren't getting rid of some of these cards and replacing them and putting the cards in your hand, the game would go on forever and ever. One of the tricky things about the game, and that's why I even had to go take a look, is that sometimes you kind of forget what the special ability of each of the flowers might happen to be. Uh, the yellow flower is super powerful because when you plant the yellow flower, you can mimic the ability of another card, another flower that's in the bed. Another flower that's in the bed, you can duplicate that ability. So it's, it's actually really cool how you can start planting flowers and it almost becomes yeah there we okay thanks uh if you plant a yellow flower and an orange flower is already in your flower bed it can copy the orange flower's ability and you replant the weed in another's garden right okay i knew it was the orange flower like i said it can be we played this three times and i gotta be honest i keep looking at <laughs> what was the special ability of this one again uh, okay, so, uh, oh, all right, so I was saying that as you're planting flowers, the flower has that special ability, and 
it's kind of cool because you start doing combos with some of these flowers. Because if you plant a second flower, as long as that second flower that gets planted gets planted into that same flower bed, you get to utilize that special ability. Now, for an example, let's say uh, you planted a red card and then you use that ability. Well, you can't use that ability for like another red card because you can't have the two which is the one that uh, bum, 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 bum. oh yeah the orange one yeah man I keep mixing up the orange and the yellow because the orange allows you to plant another card from your hand another flower from your hand but obviously if you were planting another orange flower let's say this is orange you couldn't put it into the same flower bed it's got to start a new flower bed. But anyway, as I was saying that you start dropping in these flowers and these different flower beds and they have these different abilities that you can utilize. It starts like they almost, I don't want to say they steamroll, but there are kind of different combinations that you'll utilize in the game. So it's pretty cool. It's very, very cool. So the game will continue and every, like I said, you're gonna have to have some space here because you're gonna have all these flower beds and you might wanna to like try to overlap them a little bit as you're laying your flower beds down. Once you've come to the last card of the potting shed, the game is going to come to an end. So what you're gonna do is once you've done that, you're going to actually go around and you're going to finish off each of the cards as far as who's going to be able to receive these cards. So when you get to the last card in this deck, the game doesn't complete, doesn't end because then otherwise when you had fireflies hanging out out here on bids and stuff, well, then you just wasted all that time. Nothing happens. So, what the final game mechanic is, is that you just, you'll go around and you're going to resolve every one of the cards to see who got the card. And if, of course, nobody bid on them, they end up in the compost heap. And then everybody has their flower beds and it's really, really easy when you finish and score the flower beds because the scoring is right here on this card. So if you have six flowers in your flower bed, obviously they're all gonna be different colors. So boom, 12 points. If you had five, eight points. For each flower bed, four flowers, you get five points. Then you get a bonus point for every purple flower. As I mentioned before, and yes, weeds are not considered flowers and uh orchids that are purple remember the wild card here it's either the weed or the orchid uh if that had been chosen as a purple card that doesn't count that doesn't count as a purple card you don't get that bonus point then you get the harmony bonus if they're all day flowers then you get two extra victory points and if they all happen to be night flowers you'll get four additional victory points just tally all this up and high score wins. And in the case of a tie, you break out a hoe and then you start swinging at each other. Everybody gets one shot with the hoe and whoever goes down first is the loser. No, I'm kidding. In the case of a, in the case of a tie at the end, whoever's got the most full six flower beds, six flower flower beds is declared the winner. And then there's, I think there's another, there's one other tie-breaking mechanic. But you don't run into a ton of ties with this game, at least not in the three times we played. So, uh, and I, you know, I know I'm forgetting something. I think, I, I don't know, I may have glossed over something. I don't recall. I don't believe so. Anyway, so, as far as Dance of the Fireflies, what did I think of it? 
I'll tell you one thing. For 25 bucks for a lighter game, and that's MSRP. Now, of course, you probably know better than I. A hoedown. <laughs> and yes, it's H-O-E is what I'm saying. I keep this family friendly, right? It's because I swear like a drunken sailor in my real life. I don't, uh, I don't uh, delve into that uh, other kind of language on the show. Uh, but for a family-friendly game priced at twenty-five dollars, there's a lot. There's a lot of gameplay in this. There's a loads and loads of gameplay. Oops! As I bang the mic, as I'm trying to move this on over. Yes, that's right. I did uh, early on. I believe I did mention that there are eight flowers around the clock, around the flower clock. Uh, if you're playing with four, five, or six players. With two or three players, you only have the six flowers around the clock. Anyway, um, as I was starting to say, uh, yeah, for the price point, this is a really, really nice game. Now, I pointed out to start off with that I had sort of heard that this was, you know, relaxing, kind of, oh, hey... So I'll give you a great example. My sister-in-law, Dawn, she's not really, she's not a big gamer. She's, that's not her thing, right? I mean, she's played Love Letter with us and she's played Carcassonne and yeah, it's fine. Uh, she's enjoyed those. I, she's not like chomping at the bit saying, oh, hey, Jeff, do you have Carcassonne in the car when I come over? No. So anyway, so, uh, so I'm over there last weekend and uh, I'm talking to my Cameron, uh, my nephew Cameron, who... People who watch the show know that he's 16, and he and some of his friends are, you know, part of the gang. You know, they help review stuff and things like that. So, uh, so I'm, I'm telling Cameron and a couple of his friends, oh, yeah, these are the games that I got with. And I said, uh, so we're going to play this. And my sister-in-law is sitting there, and I'm explaining it. I said, well, you know, you're, you're trying to become the, you know, the, the head horniculturist uh, because, you know, the, the, what in the kingdom, blah, blah, blah. I gave it kind of a fantasy spin. She's sitting there, she's like, oh, that sounds interesting. I'm thinking, did I just hear that right? So <laughs> Dawn ended up playing. Uh, she did all right. She didn't win. But this is one of those sorts of games where spouses, family members who... You know, a lot of stuff you might play doesn't kind of jump out at them. Kind of lighter fare. You know, a lot of people play Munchkin. Then a lot of people hate Munchkin. Uh, it's... And a lot, a lot of people like really kind of puzzly Euro games, and other people don't like puzzly Euro, Euro games. So the one thing that I found about Dance of the Fireflies is with the artwork... I mean, all you got to do is show the box, really... And uh, you will find people who may not necessarily have been interested if you just kind of explain the mechanics to them. will be like, ooh, that looks neat. Wow, oh, wow, these flowers, these are really pretty. But I would not say it's a relaxing <laughs> sort of set collecting game because you're throwing out a lot of take that whenever you can. You're trying to bluff other people into thinking, well, for an example, like uh, there, there were a few times where I had everybody at the table thinking that I had a royal firefly sitting on one of the flowers. Oh, yeah, that was that was a royal one. They're like, uh, uh I'm not messing with that. And I was like, no, it was just a regular <laughs> firefly I put down there. See, I told you. Keep them in your hand. Don't. Don't let people see where that royal firefly is going when you get it back. Uh, so I like the I like how you can you can sacrifice a royal firefly for a couple of turns and move the cards around because that's a big take that uh, throws people off a lot. Uh, I also like the fact that you've got the weed card, so you can introduce the weed card and then. I found it kind of funny because some of the players were like, ah, ha, 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 have a weed. <laughs> and then, you know, a couple of turns later, it's sort of like, okay, well, I'm playing this card with that card and I'm going to pull this weed and I'm going to drop it right back off in your garden. So I thought that was cool too. 
uh, like I said, I wouldn't say it's necessarily relaxing. It's not, it's not like diplomacy. It's not going to start fights at the game table. I've never had fights playing diplomacy anyway, but you know what I mean? So I dug it. I liked it a lot. I think the component quality is really, really nicely done. Uh, yeah. Okay. Brown. Yeah. That's not so exciting. White fireflies. Eh, okay. Am I going to ding the game for that? No, absolutely not. I just, you know, it would have been nicer with a little jazzier color than brown. But uh, yeah, the artwork, the cardstock's nice. Yeah, nice cardstock, not cheap, flimsy. You know, sometimes you take a card and you're like, that's like, wah, 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 wah. no, nice cardstock. Uh, the scoring cards, nice finish to them. So, you know, you got friends who uh, tend to spill stuff on your table. Now, cards might not do too well, but this is okay. Shouldn't, uh, shouldn't damage that. I also like the fact that there's English and German rules in the game. Not that I can speak or read German, but I thought that was a nice touch that uh, Back Spindle and Ninja Division I don't want to say smart enough. <laughs> I mean, that kind of sounds insulting. Yes, I already, I mentioned their colorblind friendly color. Oh, is, oh, that's why it's the brown. Gotcha. Thank you, Backspindle Games. Didn't even think about that. I did mention that the cards are uh, colorblind friendly. Thanks. You keep throwing me off my, 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 fa my final thoughts. Jeez, I ought to... Um, okay, so I was going to say that uh, as far as the game components, game components are really nice. Gameplay is easy. I still can't remember what all of these flowers do, but that's just my fault, not anybody else's fault. Uh, the only other thing that I would maybe think would have been, eh, it would have been okay if maybe there was a card that kind of gave the breakdown of the um, the planting phase as well as a harvest phase but yeah you're looking at just a few rules a few pages of rules not a bunch of rules i think this is a game that is going to appeal to whoops it's going to appeal to a lot of people who uh like a little more meat to their to, to their lighter game fare i am one of these players where i hate games that you play in a vacuum so i I, I say it a lot that some Euro games just leave me cold because you're really not affecting any other players, right? Just sort of like, okay, I do my thing, then it's your turn, and nothing I did really impacts you. Whereas in Dance of the Fireflies, yeah, there's some take that. Some some folks may not like that. Um, one thing that I would think as an option that people could consider would be if they if they don't want a lot of uh, kind of, you know, oh, thanks for the weed. Three player game there. I think there's three weed cards, if I remember right. You can always leave the weed cards out. I'm not going to kill anybody. You could play it where, okay, you can't sacrifice that royal firefly for a couple of turns to swap places with the cards. I mean, if you want to make it more where everybody's kind of, oh, kumbaya wouldn't necessarily be my <laughs> my cup of tea uh anyway so i would say that uh this has a lot of appeal and it's it's got more meat on its bones that it probably looks like to start with so overall on a scale of one to ten i give dance of the fireflies a very very solid 8.7 out of 10 i think that uh i don't like the word filler game they put filler and ground beef filler is bad so I think this is a really, really nice wind up, wind down game. So you wind, you know, you get your get your gaming night started with something like this or when, you know, things are starting to calm down. Some people have left. This is a very, very good game to wind down with as well. As I mentioned, that is Dance of the Fireflies from Backspinal Games and Ninja Division. Available now, came out in December here in the U.S. Carries an MSRP of 
I have seen it for less than 20 from online retailers. And I have to say that uh, if you can pick it up for less than 20 bucks, that's a fine, fine deal. Because even at the MSRP, I really think this is a game worth being in uh, many people's collections. All right, so that is it for today. Uh, sorry I was late and I just, the whole shoveling snow thing, just uh, it's kind of discombobulating. Anyway, uh, once again, I am Jeff McAleer, and when you're not watching The Daily Dope, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. Come on, you know the drill. Hey, and Pinky's chiming in. You saying goodbye, Pinky? All right, say goodbye to the folks, right? All right, I will be back on Monday with a review of Rail Raiders Infinite from Soda Pop Miniatures and... Ninja Division. Hey, there's a theme here, right? So until then, if you are getting hit by snow, oh, I hope you are not, not like we are. Hope you don't get buried. And uh, until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>